Welcome to the Motocross Vault! Hello, this is Tony Blazer, back with another review here for the Motocross Vault. What this one's going to be is the third installment in my Blazer Review series. Uh, in my first one, I covered the 125 motocross bikes I've owned. Uh, my second one was, was all the 250cc bikes I've owned. This one's going to cover like the open bikes. Uh, basically, this are, if you haven't seen the other videos, what I'm doing in this is just talking about my personal recollections about the machines, not what uh, the magazines thought, not what the classic tests said, the shootouts back in, back in the day. Uh, I do a lot of classic bike reviews where I do use that information, all these magazines I have behind me do a lot of research on them. Uh, this is not really going to play too much of a part in that. Uh, this is just what I thought of the bikes. So like I said, if you uh, like this sort of thing, check out the first review. Like I said, the first one was 125s, second one's 250s. This is going to cover open bikes. Um, I decided to keep the two strokes and four strokes together and kind of divided them by uh, CC. So this one's going to have some four strokes and two strokes in it, a little bit of everything. I haven't had as many open bikes as I have uh, the smaller machines. For the most of my career, I had mainly 125s and 250s. I've always been kind of a fan of the smaller bikes in general. Uh, but I have had several 450s and 500s and whatever I've enjoyed for different reasons. Uh, basically, they're fun. I love the way they sound, particularly the two-strokes. Uh, but they aren't always the easiest bike to ride and stuff. They're, they've always been kind of like a little niche off to the side for the most part. Uh, although I have, like I said, enjoyed a couple of 450s quite a bit. Uh, I Before I got... I don't think I got my first... Uh, open bike till pretty late in my riding career. I was probably almost 30 when I got my first one. Uh, but I had ridden open bikes before. When I was younger, racing all the time, when I had my 125, a good buddy of mine raced CR500s. I'd ridden his a couple times. Another friend of mine, Lester Carver, had a YZ490 and 87, I guess, back when I was riding 125s. And back then, when I was used to riding the small bikes, it was like eye-openingly crazy to get on that 500. I remember I got on, the first time I actually <laughs> rode that CR500, I made it about 10 feet. I was riding my 1990 CR125 at the time, and I said, hey, let me swap bikes with it. I got on the, that 500, and uh, I literally stood the thing up on the back wheel and like 10 feet. I, I You know, you used to a 125 where you grab a handful of that 500. Even if somebody tells you to be careful, the first time you're like, holy crap, this thing was a handful. Um, then <laughs> that was a really fast motorcycle. But uh, over time, I got, you know, a little more used to it, and I had a couple of 500s of my own. So uh, this one's going to cover that uh, list of bikes. So uh, here they are, my open class uh, motocross machines I've owned over the years. My first open class machine, the 1999 Yamaha YZ400F. As I said before, I didn't actually didn't start riding the bigger bikes until a little late in my career. I was 28 or 29, maybe thereabouts, when I first got my uh, first quote unquote open bike. And that was a uh, Yamaha's amazing YZ400F. Uh, the first one I had was a 1999 model. I had I was coming off a uh, CR125 at the time. I had gotten a brand new CR125 in 99. Uh, Really hated that bike. Really a terrible machine in most respects. Great looking motorcycle, but uh, performance wise, I hated it vibrating and everything else. So, anyway, long story short, I was riding over at my buddy Greg Harrison's place uh, over here in Leesburg, and one of his friends had a YZ400F, and I said, Hey, can I trade this thing for a ride? And I was, you know, my mind was blown away. I, I've ridden tons of XRs over the years. I had a smaller XR. I had an XR200, one of the first bikes I ever owned, but um, a bunch of my friends had an XR350s. I had an XR500, XR600. I've ridden all those bikes over the years. Never really liked them that much. They were always kind of a big, giant handful of a machine, and uh, while I liked the torque, they were kind of fun play bikes. The 350 in particular was a fun woods bike, but in general, not my cup of tea, but uh, this 400 was like blew my mind away i had never literally just never ridden anything like it the bike was so smooth the power was very electric very different than the later ones if you've never ridden one of these early yz 400s uh, they aren't particularly powerful they aren't like eye-openingly powerful bikes they're really more linear and smooth uh certainly nothing like a current 450 is but it's a really really uh easy to ride power. I was just like amazed by how little the vibration was. There was just none of the typical two-stroke feel to it. Um, I love the way it handled the bike itself. The turning, I guess. The turning was excellent. 
it was very stable. It was kind of strange because when you're used to two strokes, they have a very different handling. And now people kind of jump back and forth a lot more. But back then, it wasn't the way. I'd always ridden just two strokes pretty much. So the front wheel traction was just kind of crazy how much the combination of all that weight on the front and then the compression braking. When you went into the turn, essentially the bike is loading the front end because uh, those early YZFs had a whole lot of compression braking. When you chop the throttle, it was like, brrr, it really uh, slowed down. Uh, not, not as bad as like an XR, but certainly way more than what you would see in a current uh, 450. So when you went into a turn, you chopped the throttle. Uh, it really dove the front end a little bit. And that first one, the suspension was a little bit soft too. And the front end, I mean, you could just take lines that you couldn't take on a two. At least I couldn't at my skill level. I, I could dive underneath um, guys on two strokes and stuff. And uh, for a big, heavy bike, it was incredibly nimble in the turns. Just mainly because of that front wheel traction was just so great. Uh, the bike, though, in the air, it felt heavy. I mean, it felt like an XR in the air. I was um, never as comfortable jumping it in terms of... Uh, getting the feel at first because another thing to the compression braking when your first four strokes came out that compression braking was a little bit dicey if you came up and you rolled off the throttle on the face like you would on a two-stroke you could easily you know throw the thing into an endo it was a little bit took a little bit of time getting used you had to remember almost to use trailing throttle up the jump things that people just don't think about now but when you were used to a two-stroke and that freewheeling thing the whole time your whole career when you get on those things at first it was a little bit of a transition i also had a lot of problem with stalling the thing uh, the first yz 400f i think it had uh, maybe a lighter flywheel effect in general plus you come two strokes you're used to coming in you know locking up the rear wheel sliding it clutching it, blasting out, and the four-stroke really didn't lend itself, at least this first YZ400F didn't lend itself to that kind of uh, that kind of riding technique. You were much better off to use the torque, downshift it, you know, compression brake in, and then roll on the throttle early and, and roll it out. That whole brake slide in, clutch it, the thing uh, didn't work that well at that. And the other problem, too, was, like I said, it was easy to stall, and if you whack the throttle like you would on a, um, on a modern four-stroke with a, a fuel injection or a two-stroke, it would hiccup. And I had a terrible problem with stalling it, or you come into a turn, you try to brap, brap, and give it that, that whack of throttle like you normally would, and it would just go and die. Uh, XRs were notorious for that. Now, this YZ400F was way better than the older four-strokes. Uh, Kahin came out with a carburetor, I think it's called the FCR, uh, which was really a uh, like a miracle of modern technology in terms of four-strokes. The carburetor worked so much better than the old vacuum-type stuff and some of the old crap that they always had on those four-strokes, which are much more finicky. This thing... You know, compared to what came before was really remarkable. It's nothing compared to what we have now with fuel injection and stuff. But uh, at the time, it was like really eye-opening. So my feeling on the bike was excellent smooth power, like zero vibration. thought the ergonomics were really good. I thought the handling and turning was fun. It was great, like in the woods at my parents' place, that kind of tight, woodsy motocross track I had. It was super fun. You could just... You know, like I said, it would stick to the ground like glue. Um, over big jumps and stuff, though, I was always a little sketch. You know, like you hit... Um, I did some really big jumps on that thing. We had, my buddy uh, Shane had a track out in person with some just crazy, like, fifth-gear road jumps where if you um, if you were to roll the throttle, you probably would have died. It was crazy. It was like 100-foot friggin' giant doubles. And it was great for that. You get... The thing was fast. I mean, it had plenty of power. But I was always a little sketch taking off. I wanted to make sure I didn't drop the front end. So it took a little bit of an adjustment. Overall, I really enjoyed this bike. Um, I had it. I had it about a year and a half, I guess, uh, which was a long time for me at the time. Uh, I had uh, usually turned bikes like every six months or a year at the latest. I, I kept a lot of bikes. I would go through them pretty quick. But I really like this one. And uh, the only thing that got me to get rid of it was when they released the uh, YZ250F version of this. I said, you know what? I love this bike. I want something a little lighter. So then I decided to go ahead and sell it. And uh, I ordered the very first YZ250F my dealership was getting. Open class bike number two, the 1983 Honda CR 480R. While I had the uh, YZ250F, I kind of got the bug to get another open class bike. And this time I wanted to go two stroke. At that point, I had never actually owned a 500 of any kind. I'd always kind of liked them from afar. Like I said, I've ridden them. And I, was quite, I was equally terrified and fascinated with them. I love the sound. I always loved when I was racing myself, watching the guys in the 500s just like pin it. I couldn't, you know, couldn't imagine how you could ride those things as fast as they were where they were actually riding them like a 250 or 125. You see the top guy just you know, like ringing them out. It was just amazing. So anyway, I'd always had kind of a fascination with them. So I decided I wanted to get one like kind of a classic to restore. Um, so what I ended up picking up was a 1983 uh, CR480R. 
Now, the 83s had always had a little bit of fascination for me, too. Uh, my brother-in-law, Joey, my, uh, my wife's uh, brother, had, when we were little, he had had a CR-125 in 18, 1983. And this was before, you know, this is then like 1984 uh, at the time. I don't know if I even had, I might have had my Trail 90 then. But anyway, I didn't have any real motorcycles. He, I was like so envious of him. Um, I remember him telling me it had a power band and I was like, what is a power band? Is that something that's in it? I, I remember trying to figure out what the hell that meant. Like, is it a turbo? Is it a, like, you know, it's so funny. You make fun of people about that now. And I literally had no idea what that meant. Uh, so anyway, I picked up this 83 and this was a bike that I decided I was just going to take it apart, take it all the way down, restore it uh, from the ground up. I ended up, um, taking it down to the frame, painting everything, going through the motor. Uh, it had a problem with third gear, ended up uh, fixing that, which turned out to be a whole, uh, you know, wild goose chase on its own trying to find third gear. Apparently these bikes had problems with third gear. I quickly found out and a lot of them had this issue. And, uh, most of the third gears, the OEM ones were gone by 2001 or whatever the hell it was then. Um, so I had a hell of a time finding one. I finally found a gear, got it all back together, uh, Stock, the suspension was very soft. I mean, if you've ever ridden one of these old bikes that were, uh, you know, haven't been modified, the, of course, the tracks were different back then. They weren't doing big jumps and stuff. It just wasn't, uh, it was made for, uh, between the marshmallow seat and the soft suspension, it was made for the natural train, you know, bumps and whoops you would have hit. It wasn't made for jumps. I remember taking it out to a local track out here in West Virginia and just they would literally bottom out on the face of the jump, much less taking off. You just go to the stops, just taking it in the face. I was like, wow, I got to get something done. So I ended up having the uh, forks. I sent the forks off to race tech, had them put their uh, cartridge uh, em emulators in them. That made a holy crap, huge difference. Getting it sprung from my weight, getting the emulators put in there. It actually made it so you could pretty much jump anything on the track you'd want. Uh, I ended up getting a works performance shock on it. Uh, the stock shock was pretty toast and it wasn't really worth rebuilding it. So I got a completely different shock for this one. Uh, had a works performance one built for it. Pretty pricey upgrade, but um, it made, like I said, those two mods made a world of difference. I, then I could basically uh, go out to the track and anything you'd want to jump, anything I could jump on my YZ250F, I could jump on this 480. Uh, the power was phenomenal. Uh, it really sounded, ran, felt like a, a modern 500 in terms of most of the power, uh, in terms of output. Now, it was mainly a low to mid motor. This 83 had a really strong low to mid uh, power band, it came out of the hole just like you grab a handful of it and spit you off or jump any jump you want. But if you tried to rev it out, it did not pull. It felt like there was a sock in the air box when you tried to rev it out. It was kind of an issue all, all these 480s had and uh, they just weren't rev, revving bikes. You know, you basically short shifted them. I mean, most 500s, you'd be crazy to scream them anyway. So it was fine. Just keep it a tall gear, uh, you know, ride the clutch just in case. Try to keep it in third, roll through the turns and then grab a handful. The bike was super fun, uh, handled really well in terms of turning. The turning was phenomenal on it. But it is funny when you get off a modern bike and then you get on this thing back to back, you can feel the chassis flex. Those, you know, those 43 millimeter forks feel like the rubber bands and the, the chassis is just, it just feels like it's all over the place. Like the whole thing's like a banana or something. It's flexing. So that's a little weird uh, if you're not used to it. Uh, really, my main problem was the brakes. The brakes, man, that, that was the part that really held you back. You had, the bike had so much power, and you've, if you got on it real hard, you're going to go into a turn really strongly and then realize at the last second these drum brakes are not going to stop you. The back wasn't so bad. The front, uh, it had the dual leading shoe design, which was like state of the art in 1983, but... Uh, you know, by modern standards, by modern disc standards, they're pretty weak. Uh, if you really wanted to stop it, you really had to use, I, I'd use all four fingers. You had to just grab a handful of brake. Um, it's funny, you go back and, excuse me, you go back and read some of those uh, old classic magazine tests, and they talk about those dual leading shoes being, you know, like too powerful. Holy crap, you know, you grab a handful and you're going to flip over the handlebars. It's like, it's, it's just funny how perspective is different because you get off like a modern KTM and get on these drums and you're like, this is sketch. Uh, so the bike was super fun. I had a good time with it. Had a few issues. The the Kickstarter was aluminum. They had a big problem with those two. I ended up having a kick back one time and broke the Kickstarter in half. The, the knuckle busted. Uh, they would just fray over time. they get tired in the, the aluminum. And the hot setup back then was to get the 82 Kickstarter, which was steel. And I picked up one of those. I don't know if they probably dr uh, dried up by now. Uh, you know, 20 years later, but that was the hot setup. I put the, the uh, steel Kickstarter on it and stuff, and that uh, seemed to cure that problem. Uh, overall, a super, super fun bike I had a lot of fun with. Open bike number three is the 2002 Honda CRF450R. 
The next open class bike I picked up was the all new for 2002 Honda CRF 450R. This was the very first Honda 450 four stroke. Uh, before I had this, I had gone to the YZ 250F four stroke. If you saw my 250 video, no, I had a uh, kind of a love hate relationship with that bike. I loved its performance, loved the way it rode, handled, all that stuff, but it refused to start about 20% uh, of the time when I wanted to ride it. It was just a nightmare getting that damn thing lit. So one day came along, I went to, wanted to go ride with a bunch of buddies. Uh, my YZ wouldn't start. I said, you know what? Screw this. I've had enough. I'm not doing dealing with this anymore. Took it down to Loud Motorsports here in Leesburg and ended up trading it in on a all-new Honda. Um, as I said, this is the first year for the Honda. That thing was super cool at the time. Uh, the main thing that uh, appealed to me was there was no starting drill, which is kind of why I went with this and uh, not the, not another YZ. Uh, this, there was no starting drill in the dang thing. Kick it and go. It was like a two-stroke. And it started really easy, too. Um, like a thousand percent easier than either my uh, YZ400F or the 250F. Uh, great bike in terms of that. The power was not, like, awe-inspiring. This first 450 wasn't particularly powerful by modern standards. It was decent. It was good, it was good for me. I wasn't super fast. I was just kind of coming to the end of my racing career. I think this is probably the last bike that I actually raced. Um, it was really easy to ride, smooth power, not a whole lot of top end. Kind of ran like the a little bit more powerful version of the YZ400 I had. For me, perfectly great motor. It was good in the woods too. Uh, wasn't like overly powerful. Like I said, that track I have in the woods is really tight. It's not really great for like a, a true 500. If I took that 480 or something out to the uh, woods or one of my 500s later, it, it was like, holy crap, way too powerful for that. But this, uh, this first CRF 450 was good, good all around bike. And again, I split most of my time by 50, 50. I rode like in the trails, um, or on the track about half and half. So I wanted to, I always liked having a bike that I could do a little bit of both. And this was a great bike for that. Bike handled pretty well. I know some people, motocross action in particular, complained about the, the front end handling of this first version, saying they should swap out the clamps and stuff. I never had that problem. I never thought it handled funny. Never felt any kind of weird push. I thought it was a great handling motorcycle, to be honest. I never had a head shake. Turned well enough for me. Um, I like the suspension. Uh, you know, Hondas had had a really bad reputation for suspension for a long time, but right around 2002, they finally got it sorted out, and this bike had great suspension. It was way better suspended than my YZ400F. Uh, that first one, again, like I said, was kind of soft, and I never, I put stiffer springs on it to kind of compensate for the softness, but then it didn't feel like the damping was right because I didn't get it revalved. It just never quite felt comfortable to me. Um, and this Honda was great for that. So overall, I thought it was a really, really fun bike. Had a good time on it and uh, definitely an excellent machine. Really, the only reason I got rid of it was because I had that this thing I always get where I get the uh, you know, the FOMO, the fear of missing out. They had the all-new uh, 2004 uh, CRF 250R come out. All-new body work, total redesign. Um, I'd had my CRF for a couple of years at that point, and I decided, you know what, I want to try the 250F again and uh, try the new design. So I ended up trading it in on the new CRF 250, a bike I did not enjoy. My fourth open class machine is the 2005 Honda CRF 450R. After I had gotten frustrated with that uh, CRF 250R, the 2004, I had it probably a year or so, and like I said, I never hardly ever rode it, didn't really enjoy it that much. In any case, I ended up trading that in on a the all-new 2005 CRF 450R, a bike that I absolutely loved. Uh, this was a great machine. It had the new bodywork of the 04 250 had. A lot of changes they made there. Really, really phenomenal motorcycle. Really, the only problem I had with it was it was maybe a little too powerful for me. Um, again, I was not racing at this point. I had stopped racing maybe a year or so before I got this bike. I was just kind of play riding on the track and the trails and stuff. And this thing was an absolute handful in the tight stuff like that. My track up at my parents' place, it really was almost too powerful for that. Uh, really, the track part was okay, but if you were going to try and do the woods, like I said, a, a huge network of trails up there, uh, there was it was just way too, <laughs> way too much power. So the cool thing about this bike was I liked it so much, I figured, hey, I'm a, I got a exhaust, complete exhaust system off of eBay for the X model, because this bike came in an off-road version and a um, motocross version. And a good buddy of mine, uh, Shannon Bohines, had the off-road version. He had the, the X model. I'd ridden it. I didn't really care for the motorcycle. It felt like so much heavier and just more cumbersome than the motocross model, but I liked the softer power in the woods. So 
it really was great. All I had to do was put that uh, new header, which was like way longer and snaked around and the choked off exhaust on it. I didn't even have to reject the damn thing. And it ran perfectly with this other exhaust on it. It quieted it down so I didn't piss off the neighbors. And it made the bike so much mellower. And it was like a five second, well, really more like a five minute thing to basically create two motorcycles. So this thing was awesome in the woods. You put it, put the X exhaust on it, leave everything else, motocross on it. It was perfect for that. Uh, you put the R stuff back on it, take it to the track, and you had a powerhouse. It was a phenomenal motorcycle. The suspension was maybe a little stiff for my taste. It wasn't, I wouldn't call it plush. It worked well. It didn't bottom out, uh, which was great. It's always nice. I've always been heavier. I've always been a little leery to hitting big jumps and then just completely bottoming the damn thing out and crashing it to the stop. So it was nice to have a bike that you could hit a jump as hard as you wanted. You have to worry about it doing anything crazy. Um, didn't head shake. I thought it turned well. Really, maybe maybe the best overall motorcycle I've ever owned in terms of just overall competence. Uh, the only thing it didn't do, I ended up getting a um, KTM while I had this bike. I had several bikes at the same time, if you see the other videos. And then once I had the KTMs, the brakes felt like they didn't work. Uh, Honda always had a reputation of having the best brakes, but by the mid 2000s, they had kind of, uh, they were lagging way behind the Austrians and the Austrians, that KTM felt like it had a works bike brake compared to that CRF. So I ended up uh, getting braided steel lines going with an oversized rotor that helped. Uh, I had this bike like two years. I, I put more mods on this bike than any other bike I've done. I ended up getting a set of red wheels for it, which is something I'd never done on any other bike. Got a set of wheels. I spent like a thousand dollars on the damn wheels. Um, I, I spent a lot of money, carbon fiber accessories, all kinds. I love this bike. Spent a lot of uh, money blinging it out. I wish the hell I'd kept it. I should have just kept the damn thing. Whoever bought it got a steal because I, I probably spent three or four thousand dollars worth of upgrades on the damn thing before I sold it. But uh, anyway, it was a great motorcycle. I had it two or three years. Um, I finally got rid of it when I decided, uh, uh, buddy of mine, Greg, had offered me a, um, a wise, I'm sorry, a RMZ 250 as a, like a signing bonus to come work for him. I get, got the RMZ. I was riding the RMZ a lot, and the, the 450 was basically just sitting in the garage. I wasn't hardly riding it anymore, so I ended up selling it. But I should have uh, kept it because I didn't keep the RMZ long, and I'd probably still be riding the Honda if I had it. My fifth big bore is the 1990 Honda CR500R. While I had that Honda CRF450, I got the idea to get another 500 for some reason. I don't know. Like I said, a whim. I very uh, mercurial when it comes to my bike choices. And I decided I wanted to get a CR500. Not like a 480, but something a little newer, something maybe a little more reliable that I wouldn't have to worry about breaking all the time. And I found a super clean, all original uh, CRF, uh, CR500R um, on eBay. It was a 1990 bike unmolested other than just a few silly things like a uh, i think it had an enduro silencer on and a couple things other than that all stock beautiful bike and uh, i ended up i think i paid like three grand for it or something back then this is maybe 2005 2006 when i got the bike it was even cleaner you know when you buy something on ebay you're always kind of like oh i hope this is okay I hope it's not a bunch of bs this bike turned out to be just as advertised it was just a clean unmolested bike i don't even know if the guy had ever ever taken the damn top end off the thing it seemed like it was completely stock uh, really, really great find. I love this motorcycle. It's funny, the, the suspension was stock, but some about the 500, they added weight and power and stuff. It seemed to work better uh, than the, the 250 and the 125. Even back in 90, when the magazines tested, they said it worked better. I didn't really have a problem with it. Now, granted, I was no longer racing at this point. It was just a fun bike to take out to the track. And I remember taking it out there and people were like, what the hell is that? You know, the two-stroke 500 thing, Hadn't really had its renaissance yet. We were only a couple years removed from them kind of going away and stuff. And it was pretty cool. This was a neat bike in that with the stock silencer, Honda had kind of had problems with the early to mid 80s with the 500s being a little too powerful. And they had started gearing them up and putting these huge silencers on the damn things. And it was incredible what a difference it made because stock, the thing was very quiet. I remember going around... Um, out at uh, the track we out in West Virginia, we go around. It's not like a snowmobile almost. Like brrr, it was really kind of uh, neutered sounding, and it wasn't like holy crap, scary to you know, scary to death fast or anything. You could ride it, and it wasn't going to get away from you. Uh, super mellow, really. Uh, my buddy Jamie has an '89 CR500. The 89 had a much stronger hit. The 90, they kind of turned into a big tractor. And stock, it's really mellow. It's actually not scary at all to ride. And I ended up getting a pro circuit pipe and silencer for this thing, and Wow, what a difference. I mean, it was it felt like it was 10 horsepower difference. You take that boat anchor off and get rid of the stock stuff, open the exhaust up, 
and the bike completely transforms. Um, so then it was a little sketchy. Then <laughs> you had to be careful. I remember coming out of a turn, it was like a little seat bounce jump. And man, I, I just grabbed just a, just a smidge too much. And it, it stood straight up on me. And it was all I could do to grab the clutch and, you know, hit the brake. Or I just would have been, you know, ri- running behind the damn thing. So that was the thing about the 500. You come out of a turn and you might get a little wheel spin. And you think, I got this. And then if it catches traction, all of a sudden, uh, it'll spit you off. It's you know, really, in terms of power, it's not much different than a modern 450. Horsepower 450 actually has more. Now, modern 450 doesn't have quite the torque, uh, but it's really the way that power is. It's just that that kind of on-off and that sudden surge that makes the 500s kind of sketchy. And then the vibration, the sound, all that goes into it, making it feel kind of more intimidating when you're riding it. So uh, they're cool bikes. I love the looks of this thing. Um, it completed my collection of 1990 bikes. As I said, I'd had the 125, the 250, and I had the 500. Loved this machine. Um, really, really great bike. I ended up finally getting rid of it because it was one of these things where, again, it's sitting in my garage. I take it out and ride it once, I don't know, every couple of months or something. And I just didn't feel like I was getting the use out of it. I don't have the space. I have a little townhouse here in Leesburg and I don't have a, I have a tiny little garage. It's full of all kinds of other crap. So I'd end up with three or four bikes in there at a time and there's just no room. So if I wanted to get something else, I had to have something else go. And I end up letting go of the uh, the CR500, even though that one that one really pains me. I, I that's another one. I know I've heard said this a hundred times, but another one I shouldn't have let go. My sixth ground pounder is the 2005 KTM 525SX. Around 2008 or so, I came across a bike in the cycle trailer that seemed like uh, kind of too good to pass up. I, I at the time I think I had 300 motorcycles, so I didn't really need this motorcycle, but it was a 2005. KTM 525SX and with a 540 kit in it. And um, on the surface, that seems like kind of a crazy machine, but I'd always wanted one of these KTMs. I always liked the looks of the um, this racing f- uh, four-stroke engine. It's a very unique, different bike. Uh, I had had a 05 KTM uh, EXC off-road bike, so I like the bikes in general, and I thought this would be a neat machine to pick up. So it was local to me. It was over here in Falls Church. I went out there. Some guy had it on a farm. Took it for a spin. Said, okay, this thing is badass. It came with two sets of plastic. When I bought it, it had this weird blue plastic on it, which I didn't really care for at all. I immediately took all that stuff off and uh, sold it on eBay. But it came with the complete orange plastic as well. It had all that stuff. So really cool bike. And um, I don't remember what I paid for it. Maybe three grand, 3500 or something. I don't know. Maybe less. Who knows? It's all a blur at this point. But um, it was a really cool bike. Uh, I love the looks of it. The bike handled pretty well. I kind of ended up having the same problem, though, where uh, it was really a handful. That 540 was, like, wicked fast. Uh, super powerful. Explosive low-end. I don't want to explosive me the wrong word. It had like a, ran more like a traditional four-stroke. wasn't as revvy as my CRF 450. More of a chuggy kind of a power. It felt like more like a big, really powerful XR, maybe. Really neat motorcycle. I enjoyed it. It was cool. It ended up putting me on my head a couple of times, and I finally said, you know what, this thing's going to kill me. It was way too much motorcycle for uh, riding the, my track, which is, like I said, a very tight one over in the, basically in the woods. Um, it was way too much motorcycle with that. It was fun. I took it at the Buds once, and that out there, it was cool. This thing, let it get out in the open, and it's like, you let it run, it was great. In a tight track, it was way too much motorcycle. So I had it about six months and said, you know what, this was a bad idea. As cool as it is, I ended up selling it. My last open class machine, the 2009 Yamaha YZ450F. Now we've come to my last, and I would say probably best, uh, open class machine, my 2009 Yamaha YZ450F. I absolutely loved this bike. It was a great, great machine. This uh, was actually the uh, demo, uh, personal demo bike of Greg Harrison, the owner of Loud Motorsports. I ended up buying it. It had like two hours, three hours on it. It was barely, barely used. And I got it for like five grand, which when you think about it, it's a pretty screaming deal. Love this bike. Um, I know the ma- this is one of these bikes that the magazines didn't love as much. A lot of them complain about this generation of YZs not having great handling. I thought it handled great. I had no problem with the turning, no issue there. Uh, the motor was slow. Uh, but for me personally, that was great. I, I wasn't looking for an arm ripper. Uh, it didn't have anywhere near the power that 540 had or my 2005 uh, CRF had. I had this kind of a strange mechanical muffler in these years. It was super quiet. It was actually, I think the thing was about quiet stock is that uh, my CRF was with the X model exhaust on it. It was like really, really nice as far as that goes. And it really choked off the power. Now, 
at the time, you got to remember there's this thing where people are saying the 450s are getting too powerful, they're too much, and why are we racing these open bikes? So maybe that's why Yamaha was going for this. I don't know. It didn't need any repacking. Uh, but for me, it made it perfect because I could ride it in the woods and it was not overpowering there. Uh, you know, probably akin in terms of performance, maybe that original YZ400 in terms of outright power. And on a motocross track, it wasn't trying to rip my arms out of my sockets. I never opened the exhaust up. I imagine that if you um, opened the exhaust up like I did on my 1990 CR500, it probably would have been fine. It probably would have really woke the power up. If you put a Yosh or a White Brothers or whatever was the hot thing at the time on it, it probably would have really made a difference. But I was not looking to get any more power out of my five, uh, 450. Uh, my buddy Jamie had an 03 YZ450, and it was like it was too much. It was like a traditional 500. That thing was a top fuel dragster. It was sketchy to ride. Um, I thought it was just way too much, way too much. And this thing was way mellower than that. And I loved it. I thought it was great for that reason. Um, I ended up putting some cool graphics, got some, uh, Yamaha accessory graphics on it, blinged it out a little bit. Didn't go all the way with the blue wheels and everything, but uh, I was real happy with this bike. It was a good bike. The suspension was great. Probably the, maybe the best suspension I've had on any bike since maybe my 96 RMs. Uh, the forks were great. Way better than my, I had an 05 YZ250 as well. And the, this 09 suspension Way better than the uh, before they went to the SSS forks. Um, definitely great handling bike, great suspension. I didn't have any of the newer ones, um, but I would say it's probably my the last YZ450 that I like the looks of. Certainly, I hated the 10 the way it looked. I thought it was just maybe the ugliest motorcycle of all time. And I, I never rode one, but I know a lot of people had the issues with the handling. So I thought this was a great bike. Uh, Stu took it to the Supercross title, so that should be enough said right there, right? So there you have it. That's a look back at my open class motorcycles I've owned over the years. I uh, haven't had nearly as many of them as I have uh, some of the smaller bikes. As I had said earlier, I did do a review of my 125s and 250s. You can find them on my channel. I'll link to them here in the video at the end. Uh, check those out if you like this sort of thing. Uh, I also just came out, I want to get, say mention an article I just came out with on Pulp MX that covers uh, the history of motocross. I did a really... Uh, long, long researched article on the history of motocross here in the U.S. Uh, over the last 50 years. I basically divided it into the 10 events that I thought kind of shaped the, um, the landscape of the sport today. I'd love you to check that out. Let me know what you think. Um, I'll link to that in the description below as well. Uh, so if you like this sort of thing, if you can share it on social media, subscribe to the channel. I very much appreciate it. Uh, I really appreciate all the support everybody gives me on the channel. I always get a lot of positive feedback, and as I said, I really appreciate that. It's one of those nice things in my life that um, something I do is well appreciated. So uh, thank you to all you nice people out there that uh, share your comments with me every week. So until we meet again, this is Tony Blazer uh, for the Motocross Vault. Keep the rubber side down. <laughs>